Despite its childish and wildly immature nature, Talking with Dinosaurs is not intended for children. It has blasphemy, sweary words, sexy talk, and bad, bad thoughts. It is for entertainment purposes only, and while care has been taken to keep information as accurate as possible, paleontology is an ever-growing field with new data and theories constantly changing how we see these prehistoric monsters, so we make no guarantees about accuracy. Not that it matters, paleontologists are just making it all up as they go along anyway. Also, mum, I'm still very, very sorry. Romans, dinosaurs, lend me your ears. I come to praise Talking With Dinosaurs, the world's number one rated not safe for work comedy dinosaur trivia podcast hosted by a New Zealander. Not to bury it. That's right, we are back, baby. I am, as ever, your host, Stefan Ato, and I have heard your pleas. I have returned from the halls of melancholy in which I was locked. Seeing the joyous visage of a released podcast dangled tauntingly in front of my eyes, just out of reach. For four full weeks I have struggled to escape, to devise a means to escape this prison of my mind's creation. I was truly worried that I would never be back to speak to you, dear friend, about the joys of ancient extinct beasts. But then it just turned out I hadn't been turning the door handle the right way, so I mean, (laughs) that one's my bad, sorry about that. For those of you listening at a later date, or for whom this is the first episode and you don't know what I'm talking about, I missed an episode, which you'd only really notice if you checked the episode release dates, and I highly doubt you're that kind of weirdo. It doesn't matter. I'm back anyway to spin some shit yarns about the creatures that have captured our imaginations for generations, and undoubtedly shall for generations to come. I mean, assuming humanity survives the next few years. I'm I'm not saying that we won't, and I don't mean to bring the mood down, but you know, who knows? Maybe science is right, and we're dragging the Holocene kicking and screaming towards the greatest mass extinction apocalypse since the Permian Triassic event. Fun times. But if we don't have much time left, that means we've got to live every moment and love every day. So you know what? Fuck the rules. We're going to go wild here at Talking With Dinosaurs. Outrageous. Chaos. Hail Eris. Etc. Today we're looking at cetaceans. Which is a group that isn't extinct. Yet. I mean, whether you've heard the name before or not, you definitely know of at least some cetaceans. You may know them as uh, whales. Or dolphins. Porpoises. You know, the big wet mammals. You know the ones. So what's so impressive about cetaceans? Well, how about the fact that the largest animal of all time is a cetacean? And is still alive to this day. Yo, you did know that? You knew about the blue whale? Do you know it could weigh up to 200 tons? 200 fucking tons? I can't even comprehend that. It would take almost three and a half thousand people to outweigh a blue whale. We are proud compatriots of the largest creature of all time, but where did this Brobdingnagian titan come from? Well, Stefan has answers if you have coin. Well, no, you don't, you don't need to pay. It's, it's, it's free. It's free. But as you no doubt know, whales and other cetaceans are mammals, just like us. Unless you're a reptoid Columinato body double, I mean, obviously that doesn't include you then. The earliest ancestor discovered that whales evolved from was about the size of a wolf, and it was closely related to the ancestor of hippos, deers, and giraffe. You know, the hoofy doofers. Even toed ungulates are what they're called to differentiate them from the odd toed ungulates, like rhinos, horses, and tapirs. No, they're not called odd toed because their feet are weird, it's to do with which toes they put their weight on. Although if you've ever looked at Tapir's feet, you would definitely agree that it tastes pretty weird. You haven't? Huh. To each their own, I guess. I just don't expect an invite to my Tapir tasting nights anytime soon. So let's get back to cetaceans. Well, more accurately, Archaeoceti at this point, the ancestors of whales. So how did these dog-like hoofy boys grow into the biggest goddamn motherfucker of all time? Well, it was hard work, perseverance, and about 50 million years of evolution. Amazing what you can achieve when you set your mind to it. 
and you also don't have some kind of neurodivergence that makes setting and achieving goals now impossible. Pakacetus was the name of this dedicated grower, which roughly translates to huge fish of Pakistan, a name which makes no sense without context, given that this dude was an average sized mammal, and Pakistan wouldn't exist for another 49,999,939 years. It's like if humans eventually evolved to become the size of mice, and referred to us as Giganticus Loglobalonia. Loglobalonia, of course, being the name of the Middle East in 50 million years. What with that area being the cradle of civilization at all? You know what? That gag didn't really work, and I'm sorry. I'm fucking proud of the concept, but this time it just it didn't it didn't pan out. It's not its fault. It's mine. They can't all be winners. So I'm sorry, great potential joke about the relative temporal context of taxonomy. Maybe one day your time will come. So despite being descended from hundreds of million years of dedicated landlubbers, Pakacetus had a dream. A dream about ruling the seas, gracefully drifting the oceans, singing and feasting when it wanted. And so it set about making those dreams a reality. It spent generations frolicking in rivers, slowly evolving more and more aquatic adaptations, less fur, more flipper-like limbs. And then as time went on, eventually they were ambulocetus and living full-time in the water. They were well on their way. They couldn't give up now. You can do it. Suddenly, before you know it, well, tens of millions of years later, they were the mighty Bacillosaurus. Now they are getting whaley. At up to 18 metres long, these slim sea beasties look more like the mosasaurs of old than modern whales, which is why their name means King Lizard rather than Bacillocetus or King Whale, which would have made way more sense. Is this a good place for another jab at that contextual taxonomy joke? Hmm, I can't decide. How about you call the Talking With Dinosaurs hotline quickly and press 1 for me to give it another go, or 2 if I should let dead jokes rest and leave my perverted necromancy for my personal life. I'll wait while the results come in. Boop, boo, doo, boo, doo, boo, boo, doo. Oh, here they go. Uh-huh, uh-huh. Uh, so that's a unanimous no then. Bugger. Oh well, probably for the best really. I hadn't really come up with anything new. Oh shit. I meant to mention that the calls cost $14.99 US a minute. Ah uh, well, I hope you all like phone bills. So, Bacillosaurus was a great start. Hell, if it were me, it's where I probably would have stopped and said, you know what, fuck it, that's good enough. But not cetaceans, they were just getting started. Not content with aping the ancient marine reptiles, they set off to carve their own evolutionary path. Not long after that was the great split between the whales that would become baleen mouthed filter feeders and the toothed whales who'd become sperm whales and dolphins and such. This set off a great arms race, well, flipper race, of who would become the great monarch of the ocean, the ruler of the sea, the biggest, blobbiest oceanic mammal. Toothed whales came to an early lead, with sperm whales evolving big and strong to hunt other whales, toothed and baleen. As discussed in an episode, I can't be bothered looking it up, um... You know, the Megalodon one. You, you can find it yourself, I believe in you. Anyway, as mentioned in that episode, there was a massive sperm whale known as Leviathan, a contemporary of the Megalodon, who was very, very good at eating toothed whales. But it wasn't so great at competing with the mighty, mighty Megalodon, and so it disappeared somewhere between 5 to 10 million years ago. And then something amazing happened. With sperm whales giving up the whole eating other whales thing, with sperm whales giving up the whole eating other whales thing, and Megalodon being out of the picture, baleen whales took the whole K-selection long life big babies to the absolute extreme, and started sprinting towards becoming just fucking massive. In what was a geologically or evolutionary tiny amount of time, they got out there, pulled themselves up by the blowholes, and really stuck into it. It wasn't long until they achieved their goal, and were floating around with the blue whale finally achieving the impossible, and being the most absolute unit the world had ever seen. But what about our friend the sperm whale? Well, don't you worry about them. They evolved to be the largest active predator of all time. While nowhere near the massive flesh that the mighty blue whale is, the sperm whale's diet of squid seems to be keeping them going along nicely. It's nice to have a happy ending, you know. Well, well, kinda. No, not really. If you're not a big fan of depressing endings, maybe skip the next few minutes, could be kind of a bummer, come back after the Q&A section. 
Because, as usual, whales were on top of the world, well, the sea anyway, until humans started really fucking up the ocean. Pretty much as humans really got into this boating business, they got really into killing the biggest creatures they could find, eating them, or just turning bits of them into candles or perfume. Hell, some of them even just did it for fun. And so these tiny, normally inconsequential land beasts started harpooning every whale they could get their bloody hands on in every part of the world. Thankfully, us humans only hunted whales for... Oh, we've been doing it for 4,000 years. Oh, and we haven't stopped. Despite driving a huge amount of species to the brink of extinction and wiping out several species of dolphin. Great. Woo, humanity. How did life survive without us? Ah, oh, oh, much better it turns out. Right, well, um, that depressing ending is all I've got for this majestical beast. Uh, but something seems off. Something's missing from this episode. Oh no, I forgot to make jokes about sperm whale penises. Oh god, this whole podcast is about stupid genital jokes and I skipped it completely. Ah, uh, this episode is already going longer than I expected. Do I have time for any? No? Damn it. I'll, look, I'll just quickly say that whales have the largest known penis and the largest known testes. And that's why they're known as the sperm whale. Ha ha! No, that sucked. Um, and it's not why they're called that. It's actually because they have a large organ in their head filled with about 2,000 litres of a white sticky substance called spermaceti, which they use to help echolocate and it helps them sing really loud. Do I have time for a joke about how you should never order spermaceti at an Italian restaurant? No, damn it, not really. Well, I guess I'll just give whales 4,000 out of 10 for how long I've been hunting the poor buggers. And I'll be hunting for the Q&A section, which will be here after the break. This is Kim, your friendly neighborhood ER nurse. I'm the host of People Are Wild, the only podcast that claims to bring medical entertainment, medutainment, on a weekly basis. I can be found on your favorite podcast listening app, iTunes, and Google Play. And you can talk to me on Twitter at People Are Wild. Well, we are back for questions and answers, and let's just smash right fucking into it like a coyote into a badly painted hillside. My first question, here we go. Mr. Ato, I have recently moved to rural Montana, an area known for its dinosaur fossils, and my town has a creationist dinosaur museum. The owner of the museum says that all dinosaurs are just the same dinosaur type that grew up slightly differently, and they were all on Noah's Ark. He also tries to explain tectonics by referencing an outdated theory to explain drift. It's a whole thing. Should I rip up my four-year geology degree and seek a new degree at this museum? Yours sincerely, Daniel. P.S. According to their website, creationtruth.org, they seem to have some pretty good fossils on display. But also, it's like, it's like eight bucks, so I'd be donating eight dollars to their cause. Is it right to go there? Well, Daniel, I would probably keep a hold of that degree because it's it, it might be worth some money one day. I mean, not with the way the society's going, but hey, we'll give it a go. But as for uh, paying $8 to go look at it, I mean, I say go for it. They're pretty good fossils. It's well worth the money. And you always have the possibility of hanging out by the exhibit and giving real scientific literature to any poor kids stuck there while their parents aren't looking. Poor things need a nice counterbalance to this nonsense their parents are probably peddling them. The other option, of course, is to organize a heist of the museum and retrieve the fossils for real science. I'm going to go out on a limb and assume any fossils privately owned by a religious organization being used to spread fairy tales probably haven't been properly described or investigated. It's not a crime if it's for science. Disclaimer, it is definitely a crime, even for science. Talking with dinosaurs accepts no responsibility for any damages that occur by following this stupid joke-ass advice. We do demand a cot of any profits, however. Now, after you've done that, feel free to hit up Ken Ham. The bastard never wrote me back, and I still have his home address. Right, that was just the one question this week, and now it's time for great contributions to dinosaur science by non-paleontologists. Because fuck those guys. This week's contributor is Terence. He knows what he did. You can ask him if you want to hear about it. So, that's all for this week. Thank you all so much for the support while I was away. To be honest, you didn't seem too bothered that I was gone, so maybe I should get away more often, huh? How'd you like that? Nah, just kidding. I missed you too much. You're great. You just need to remember that. I love you just the way you are. I also love Electricity for the awesome theme song and Adam Donahue for the awesome logo. 
Thank you for being the best. You know what else is the best? When you send me ridiculous dinosaur questions for me to answer. Feel free to send them to talkingwithdinosaurs at gmail.com, tweet them at TalkingDinoCast, or message me on Facebook, Instagram, or Discord. Remember to donate to local learning institutions and museum, and also to me on Ko-Fi or PayPal, but only if you've already supported someone making the world a better place. And hey, if you get the chance to make a world a better place, do it. Every chance you get. Especially in the November elections, America. Make a fucking change. You can do it. I believe in you. This is turning into Good Morning Humans with too many small shots of positivity. Let's end it before I start rambling about whales and get depressed again. Okay, so that's it for this week. Ka kite anō. I've been Stefan Ato, and we have been talking with dinosaurs.